Hello everyone. I want to talk about substitution today first by reminding you of where we were uh, when I last talked to you. We have language. Language is divided into texts, right? Uh, uh, newspaper articles, restaurant menus, poems, and so on. We know a text is a text because the different parts of the text, the different clauses join together cohesively, right? They stick together in various ways. You know about reference, right? That reference is one of the cohesive properties of language, that there are words like them and she and we and so on that refer to other parts of the text that presuppose that you can find what they mean in other places in the text. Uh, and you know that reference included personal demonstrative and comparative reference, right? If you wanted to make the org chart go down further. Substitution is another kind of cohesive relation. Uh, so it fits in like this. Uh, it's different. It has many things in common with reference. You can still use words like anaphoric, cataphoric, presupposition, and so on. But it has enough differences that it's a separate category of cohesive relation. By the time that you're finished this series of uh, lectures and seminars, you will know about five types of cohesive relations. So where it says cohesion there, there'll be five coming down, right? The second one today is substitution. A substitute is a counter that is used in place of the particular item. That's probably not very helpful. Uh, that's fine because I'm going to explain in more detail what that means. So we've got examples here. My axe is too blunt. I must get a sharper one. You think Joan already knows. I think everybody does. Uh, what are the substitutes? You might want to pause and think about that. In, in the second sentence of A and in the second sentence of B, there's a word that substitutes for a word in the first sentence, right? Uh, which word is it that you only know what that word means by looking back at the first sentence. Uh, and now that you, sorry, I went too quickly. We've got one, which is acts and does, which is knows, right? You can see how that works. Uh, my axe is too blunt, I must get a sharper axe. Okay, so you could have said that. You could say, my axe is too blunt, I must get a sharper axe, right? That's possible. Instead here, you said, my axe is too blunt, I must get a sharper one. Now, what's going on? It says the substitute has the same structural function as the original. Structural here means grammar. Grammar means nouns and verbs. What is axe? My axe, axe is a noun, right? I must get a sharper one. Here, one is a noun, just like axe. Uh, we could also do it with verbs, right? You think Joan already knows. Knows is a verb. I think everybody knows. I, you, sorry, I think everybody does. But you know, you're again, like with A, where you could have said acts, but you said one. In B, you could have said knows, but you said does. Uh, and we'll look at uh, how that works in more detail. But just for now, you can see that. So these are substitutes, right? Where one substitutes for acts, does substitutes for knows. That's all for now, right? One uh, and acts are both nouns does and knows are both verbs, right? So we're looking for words like that, uh, be they nouns or be they verbs, where you've used a different word, but it means almost the same thing. Not the same thing, but almost the same thing. We'll see why in a minute, right? Uh, we can also do it with clauses, right? Here, think of so, has Barbara left? I think so. What are you saying here? You're saying has Barbara left? I think Barbara has left. So you can have uh, a no noun, a verb or a clause, right? Uh, those are listed as being uh, nominal substitution, verbal substitution, clausal substitution. It's written down soon, right? Nominal is N-O-M-I-N-A-L, nominal for noun, verbal for verb, clausal for clauses, right? Uh, like reference substitution makes links, cohesive links between parts of the text, right? Uh, like with reference, it's usually endophoric. It's usually in the text, right? You're, like in those examples I gave, how did you know what uh, acts? How did you know what does? How did you know what so meant? You looked back in the text. Possibly it can be exophoric, not so much, but it's possible, you know, if someone's holding a big fish and uh, you look and say, wow, 
And they might say, ah, you should have seen the one that got away. And now you'd know the other uh, one. You say, oh, the fish, right? So you'd be able to figure out from the context. Remember, exophoric means looking at the context. You'd be looking at the context. You'd see a big fish, the one. Oh, I guess the one means the fish here. Okay. So substitutes have many of those same properties as references. Uh, types of substitution that I've already said it, but now you can see them here on a nice single slide, right? We have nominal substitution, verbal substitution, and clausal substitution. There are only these words that function as substitutes. For nominal substitution, there's, there are only the word one, ones, and same. For verbal substitution, there's only the verb do. Of course, it could be in any tense and aspect. It can be do, does, did, will do, will be doing, will have done, and so on, right? Uh, but it's the verb do in any of those forms. And for clausal substitutes, you only have so and not, and that's it, right? Notice that with uh, has Barbara left, I think so, I think Barbara has left. Or you could say has Barbara left, I think not, I think Barbara has not left, right? That's it. So there are three types of substitution, nominal, verbal, clausal. And only those words there can function as substitutes. If you see another word like, for example, it, you already should know it is a reference. It can't be a substitute because it is a reference. As you'll see, they can be similar, but they are different enough that they are separate categories, right? So one is a substitute, it is a reference. Let's look at how that works, right? Think carefully about it and one in these two examples, right? Reference, where's my old jacket? I saw it in the hall. Substitution, where's my old jacket? Your new one is in the closet. What, if you can pause and think about what does it presuppose? What does it, how do you interpret it here versus how do you interpret one in the substitution example, right? You'll see that they're not identical. They're similar, but not identical. So pausing and thinking about it. And now you're back. And I hope you've seen that in reference, where's my old jacket? I saw it in the hall. It means your old jacket. You're talking about the same thing, right? In the example for reference, A is talking about my old jacket. And B is also talking about it, which is that same old jacket. With substitution, something different happens, as you can see now, I hope, right? A is talking about where's my old jacket. A is talking about his or her old jacket. B is still talking about jackets, but not the same jacket, right? A is talking about my old jacket. B is talking about your new jacket. That's what happens whenever you use a substitute, right? With a reference, you're always talking about the same thing. If I say Gwen and I are having lunch together, we are going to, the we means Gwen and I. Gwen and I and we refer to the exact same two people, me and my wife, right? With substitution, you're always referring, sorry, I shouldn't say referring. With substitution, you're always presupposing the same general type of thing, in this case, jacket, but a different subtype, right? Picture it like with substitution, A refers to jackets, old jacket, B refers to jackets, new jacket. That always happens where the general class of things stays the same and the subclass changes, right? If you thought, think back to that example I gave of the fish, someone's holding up a large fish, you should have seen the one that got away. We're talking about fish, you have, in the first case, the fish I'm holding, and in the second case, the one that got away, a different fish, not this one that I'm holding. That's what always happens with substitution. You are talking about the same general category, but a different subcategory. As you see here, with it means the same old jacket, whereas one just means jacket, but not the old one. We'll get on to some more examples here. Uh, one and ones as nominal substitute is the same, uh, except that ones is plural, right? Uh, I shoot the hippopotamus with bullets made of platinum because if I use a leaden one, if I use a leaden bullet, his hide is sure to flatten him. So in the first time bullets are referred to in red, we're talking about bullets, but bullets generally, 
a subcategory bullets made of platinum. In blue, we're referring to leaden bullet, right, bullets, but now they are made of lead. It doesn't matter that we've switched between singular and plural, right, or rather plural, bullets is plural, and then you're saying leaden one singular. That doesn't matter, right? You switch when you use substitutes, you switch back and forth between singular or plural number, and it doesn't matter, right? That's not an important thing. The important thing is that it's always referring to the same category, but a different subcategory. Bullets, platinum, bullets, lead. You can say that more formally here. One, right, the blue one, functions as the head of a nominal group, right? Nominal means noun, right? A noun group. We have a noun group, uh, lead in one. The word one there functions as the head, bullets, but the made of platinum part disappears, right? And now we have a leaden one. So that's what always happens whenever you use a one or a nominal substitute. You keep the main word, the head word, right? Fish, uh, axe in the very first example, bullet here. You keep the head word. You get rid of any modifiers, right? Sharper axe, uh, old jacket, whatever. You get rid of the modifiers and you bring in some new modifiers. Uh, the, the Another example of how the numbers don't matter, right? Here's a little poem. Uh, the first sentence refers to cherry, right? Cherry, singular, full and fair ones, full and fair cherries, right? Cherries. So the switching in number is not important. It's important to look for what's changed between the original and the substitute. What subclass has changed? Uh, we can't, as a note here, we can't substitute for what are called mass nouns or non-count nouns, right? Uh, a works, right? These biscuits are stale, get some fresh ones. Uh, that works because biscuits is a count noun. You can count them, right? One biscuit, two biscuits, three biscuits. Uh, bread is a non-count noun. We don't really say one bread, two bread, three bread, right? We just say some bread. Uh, so you, we don't really say things like this bread stale, get some fresh one, get some fresh ones, get some fresh. Uh, it feels, it's possible. I'm not saying you never say it, but we tend not to do it. It's awkward, right? It's interesting, by the way, that for mass nouns, also known as non-count nouns, generally we uh, stop counting things when they get to be about the size of a P or smaller, right? A P or smaller, you know, we say one apple, two apples, three apples. Do you want, do you want an apple? Do you want two apples, right? But like if you're having dinner, you know, you don't ask someone, do you want 17 peas? You just say, do you want some peas, right? Rice, right? Do you want 257 rice? No, right? You just say, do you want some rice? So it's generally quite small things are non-count, but sometimes larger things, for some reason, furniture is non-count, right? You say you've got a lot of furniture. You don't say you have 27 furniture, right? I realize, of course, you can say you have 27 pieces of furniture. You can say you have 20 grains of rice, but then you're counting pieces or grains, right? Rice itself, peas, furniture, and so on, they aren't really countable in most cases, right? Uh, okay. Uh, where were we? So here's some more examples of nominal substitution, right? This is the kind of place where you might want to pause for a bit and try it yourself. Look at the, the word one or ones. Uh, you've got a green, uh, a blue, a green, and a red. What word is it substituting it for in each case? And what's been changed, as I said, right? What's been changed? Uh, in other words, what class are you talking about and what subclass has changed from the first time it's mentioned to the second one? Uh, I believe I, did I, no, I didn't spell them out so I can do it for you here after you pause for a second. And then so you'd see, now that you've finished pausing, you'll see that the blue one uh, refers to story, right? But this story was perhaps the strangest one of all time. But notice we've gone from talking about stories strange to in the second sentence story this story right uh with the green what kind of engines do you want engines with whistles or engines without so it's engines the first sentence just talks about engines what kind of engines 
whistle engines, no whistle engines. Uh, my dear, I must get a thinner pencil. I can't manage this one a bit. It writes all manner of things that I don't intend. One means pencil, but here we can see, right? What are we talking about? Pencils, the first reference, thinner pencil. I can't manage this pencil, right? So pencils, thinner pencil, this pencil. You can see the in all of those cases, you're talking about two different things. So one, what does one mean, right? Uh, well, it's doesn't really have meaning on its own. Remember, to be clear, because sometimes people get this confused, we're not talking about the uh, cardinal number one, one, two, three, four, right? It's the same form, O-N-E, pronunciation one, but we're talking about a different function, right? You've got to keep that in mind that, you know, if you see something like there were three little pigs, uh, there were two little pigs, there was one little pig, don't get tricked there. That one little pig is just counting. That's a, a cardinal number. We're not talking about that, right? We're talking about a word that looks the same because it's spelled O-N-E, but it has a different function. It substitutes for any other noun, right? A noun, one here, it carries over the head. It, by carry over, it means you're reusing the same head word, bullet, but you're changing any modifiers. Let's look at, oh, sorry. Uh, look at another example to see how that works differently from reference, which you're familiar with, right? Notice how here I have a blue pen, you can have it. It and blue pen are co-referential. They refer to the same thing. The the pen that I'm holding, I have a blue pen, you can have it, right? Blue pen and it both mean this pen that I'm holding in my hand at the moment that I'm offering you. Whereas with substitution, I need my blue pen, you can have my black one, you can picture that I'm offering you a different one, right? I, you ask me, can I have a pen? I say, well, I need my blue pen. You can have my black one. There's two things there. Both are pens, but first I'm talking about blue, then I'm talking about the black. That's what always happens with substitution. Reference presupposes the head and any modifiers. It means the head pen and the modifiers a blue. Substitution presupposes only the head. One means pen. It does not mean my blue. That's the name for that is repudiation. Uh, to repudiate means like to block or cancel something, right? So whenever we use a substitute, we carry over the head. One carries over the word pen, but the modifiers are repudiated. You could say it this way, right? In, in this example, I need my blue pen, you can have my black one. One substitutes for pen, my black repudiates my blue. That's what always happens. There's something carried over, in this case pen, and something is repudiated, blocked. My blue is repudiated by my black, right? That's the new information is my black, the old information, my blue, is repudiated. That always happens. Uh, think of it here, right? We have no coal fires, only wood ones. I imagine you can see that now. What does one substitute for? I'll leave time for you to, to think it or say it, right? What does one's substitute for? One's substitutes for fires. Where is the repudiation? Wood repudiates coal, right? Fires we have no coal fires, we're talking about fires, coal, only wood ones, now we're talking about fires, wood. So that always happens, right? Like this, if you want it more elaborately. Fire is carried over, coal is repudiated. And that's the difference between substitution and reference. Reference always refers to the same thing, substitution, the head stays the same, the modifiers change, right? The new modifiers repudiate the old modifiers. See, there's a sub, there's a reference. We have no coal fires. They, they means coal fires. So you're talking about fires, coal, and then they, you're talking about fires, coal, same thing. No class change, no subclass change. Uh, here's a picture, if that helps, right? To picture it that way. Good. Uh... Don't get confused, as I said earlier, with other meanings of one. Uh, 
Sometimes we use one just to generally mean like people, everybody, like a personal pronoun. When you say things like this, one never knows. What do you mean here? Uh, people never know what might happen. Uh, one should be quiet in the library. Uh, one must look ways both ways before crossing the road. These ones are personal pronouns. Don't try to make it substitute for something that won't work. And of course, as I said, the counting one, two, three, he made one very good point. Don't try to make that into a a reference, uh, sorry, into a substitute, right? The, the way to picture it, an easy way to picture it is if you can, you know it's a cardinal number if it's modifying something, right? One point, what kind of point? Good point, what kind of point? Very good point, what kind of point? One point, one very good point. That's a counting one if it's modifying something and just by thinking, well, could I say two, three, four in that place? Yes. He made one very good point. He made two very good points. He made three good, very good points. Oh, that's just counting, right? Whereas that doesn't work if I'm holding up two pens and I say, I need my black pen. You can have the blue one. I need my black pen. You can have the blue two, the blue three, the blue four. No. What would you say there to go from, you can have the blue one. If you wanted to make that plural, you'd say you can have the blue ones, right? The singular of the nominal substitute is one, the plural is ones. The singular of the cardinal number one is one, the plural is two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? So try that. If you're trying to figure it out, if it's a cardinal number or a nominal substitute, think if I had more, would it be ones or would it be two, three, four? I'm not talking about personal pronoun much because I think A, that's rare and B, it's pretty obvious, right? You're just saying people might never know, people never know what might happen. Uh, same works the same way, same works the same way. It can be a nominal substitute. It can be a comparative reference, as we saw before. You've got to distinguish between them, right? When you say she has the same phone, you're just comparing the phone. Notice it's modifying the phone. It works as a modifier here, right? What kind of phone? Same phone. You're comparing two phones, my phone and her phone. How do they compare? She has the same phone. Or think about how you'll know it's a... a comparative reference, as we talked about last week, if you could put in similar or different, right? She has the same phone, she has a different phone, she has a similar phone. Then you know you're comparing. Uh, whereas as a substitute, you're doing this, right? I'll have two poached eggs on toast. And then Gwen says, I'll have the same. I'll have the poached, I'll have two poached eggs on toast. Notice, she can't say here, I'll have the similar, I'll have the different. That doesn't work, right? She's substituting the word same, but talking about how uh, she's using the word same as a substitute instead of just saying, I'll have the two poached eggs on toast too, please, which of course she could say. Same as a substitute is rare compared to one and once. So we won't say much more about it other than that, right? It does have that characteristic of repudiation, as you saw. Uh, Sorry, so I'll say this. I'll say this last thing about same as a substitute. It does have that characteristic of repudiation. If she says, I'll have the two poached, if she said, where is it? I'll have two poached eggs on toast, please. I'll have the same. Notice we're both talking about poached eggs on toast, but I'm talking about the ones I want. She's talking about the ones she wants, right? She doesn't actually want my poached eggs on toast. She wants a different subclass, ones for her, not one for me. Or she could do something like this, which would maybe be more obvious, right? I'll have two poached eggs on toast, please. She has a, I'll have two, I'll have the same, but fried. You can see she's talking about two eggs on toast, but fried repudiates poached. Uh, so that's maybe a more obvious example of nominal substitution using the word same that's going to be the end of it because it's not used that much compared to one and ones. Verbal substitution is, I think, uh, as I said earlier, just the word do, and it's used in all of its forms. Oh, do, does, did, doing, will be doing, have been doing, has been done, and so on. Uh, always what you're substituting is the word, the verb do, for another verb. The words did not come the same as they used to come, right? Here, do does not mean do, like do your homework, like try to accomplish, right? Here, do substitutes for the word come. Uh, 
I don't know the meaning of half those long words. And what's more, I don't believe you know the meaning of half those long words either. Uh, so it can substitute for a simple one word verb like do and the blue do substitutes just for the verb come. The word come one word, the red do substitutes for a whole verb, phrase, and possibly into the whole, everything except the, the subject, in other words, right? Um, so it, don't just look for the individual verb. Pick the part that makes sense. Is it just the word come, as in the blue one, or does it make more sense to take the full verb and the rest of the predicate like you've done with the red one? Uh, here I'm just showing them again. Uh, together so you can compare. Um, it can be, an, what often happens, what I mean here can cross sentence boundaries. Sometimes the examples, at first, to make them clear, I, textbooks in general, use examples that are simple, one sentence, right? Like, the words did not come the same as they used to, where the do and the come are in the same sentence, or be is a longer sentence, the red do and what it substitutes for are in the same sentence. So for simplicity, that's a good way to start. But in reality, we don't have to substitute for things in the same sentence. Here it's in a different sentence, right? He never really succeeded in his ambitions. He might have succeeded in his ambitions, one felt, had it not been for the restlessness of his nature. Here it's in a different sentence. It doesn't even have to be just the previous sentence. It could be two sentences back, three sentences back, right? So the I'm saying this to make it clear that the examples I give at first are, I hope, to promote clarity, understanding. But we can do things a lot more uh, complicated than just using substitutions and references for, and any other form in the same sentence. Uh, there is the same thing, repudiation, when we, when we talk and use verbal substitutes, there is that repudiation, right? Uh, does granny look after you every day? And then the other, it probably should say A and B here, sorry. One person says, does granny look at you, does granny look after you every day? And the other says, she can't do it weekends because she has got to, she has to go to her own house, right? So you realize that do here, the red do means look after me, right? Does granny look after you every day? She can't look after me at weekends. You realize that that's what it substitutes for. And do you see the repudiation, right? The question is talking about granny looking after you every day. The answer, she can't do at weekends, granny looking after you not every day because not weekends. I won't go into it much more than that because we already talked about repudiation in the first case of nominal substitution, but you can, we'll practice later, of course, right? Uh, there's, all, there's still that repudiation. You're talking about this, with nominal substitution, we were talking about the same class of thing, axe, fish, fire, whatever. With verbs, we're talking about the same class of action, in this case, looking after, uh, and then the subclass looking after when, right? On weekends, well, uh, or sorry, every day, or well, no, not every day, only during the week, because not weekends. Clausal substitution, sorry, I'm going to pause for a second, I need a drink, sorry. Sorry about that. Clausal substitution and verbal substitution. Look at the difference here in the amount of information that is substituted for. Sometimes people get this a bit mixed up. Remember, the only possible words that can act as clausal substitutes are so and not. So I say, is there going to be rain? And she says, the weather report says so. So presupposes the whole clause there is going to be rain. And uh, you know that's a clause because it's got a subject there and a verb is going to, and then the rest of it, to be, uh, be rain, right? Verbal substitution, 
It's the verb and maybe more of the verb phrase and predicate, but not the subject. That's the important thing to notice, right? If I say, did the rain soak the garden? And she says, it must have done. Done means soak the garden. It doesn't mean, it, it doesn't presuppose the subject, which was uh, the rain, right? What happened to the rain? I said, did the rain? What happened to the rain? She used a reference, it, right? It references the rain, done substitutes for soak the garden. Uh, so in that case, she's using a reference and a substitute, but it's a verbal substitute. Whereas whenever you use so or the negative form not, it's a very convenient way of substituting for the whole previous clause, right? Is the weather, is there going to be rain? The weather report says so, or the weather report says not. Uh, as I showed here, I've, and uh, you can use the language that way, right? Not presupposes there is going to be rain. You know, an inter I haven't said this yet, but a good way to think of this is um, imagine this works for reference, for substitution, for everything, right? Imagine someone entered, uh, let's say we're talking, right? And someone enters the room right as you they enter the room only to hear Gwen say, the weather report says not. So some of us are in the room. I say, is there going to be rain? Gwen says, the weather report says not. Now, all of us who are in the room know what not means. All of us who are in the room know that not is interpreted as the weather report says there is not going to be rain. Think about how someone who entered the room only to hear Gwen talk, they missed what I said. So they come in and they hear Gwen say, the weather report says not. That person who's come in just at that point knows those words. They know they're all English words, but they don't know how to interpret the word not there. Perhaps Gwen is saying the weather report says there is not going to be snow. The weather report says uh, it won't rain until next Saturday, whatever, right? They don't know exactly what's meant. Uh, so that's often a useful way to think about it, right? What do we who've seen the earlier part of the text, in this case, is there going to be rain? What do we know that someone who arrived a bit late doesn't know? Uh, that's the way to think of how you interpret these, about how to explain what is missing for the person who arrives late. So where were we like this, right? You've got language uh, being broken into discrete chunks of language called texts. There are various ways that we know a text exists as a text because it sticks together. We saw reference in the past. Today we've talked about substitution for now what you should be sure to know is this, right? Uh, that there are three types, if you, if, you, if you know this, you're in a good position to have a base of understanding how this works, right? If you know that there are substitutes, which are nominal, verbal, clausal, and that the types of nominal substitute are one and it's plural ones, and very rarely same, that the verbal substitute is do, and that the clausal substitutes are so and not. And that if you can remember that and think about how to distinguish between reference and substitution, it's that word repudiation, right? That reference, the reference refers to the same thing exactly. The substitute refers to the same type of thing, but in a different subclass, right? My ax is too blunt, I must get a sharper one talking about axes, but first it's the blunt axe I have now, next it's the sharper axe that I must get, and so on for verbal substitution and clausal substitution. Good, so keep that list in mind, nominal verbal clausal with the associated term repudiation, and you're in a good position to keep going with this topic. Thank you very much, bye.